Thanks, Steve. So today, we continue our series in Romans called We Are in the Same Boat. We are in the same boat. Today's message is part three. I think we'll do one more after this. Yes, then maybe we'll, we'll get out of the boat for a while. What do you think? Today's message, we are all in the same boat, part three. We're continuing our look at Romans chapter three. And last week, we left off at verse 26 of chapter three. We pick it up again today at verse 27. But before we dive into the verses, it is very important to remember the context. Why context helps us understand the text. Now, do you remember the context of this passage and the book of Romans? Hmm? Under Claudius the emperor, all the Jews were deported from Rome in 49 AD. Then in 54 AD when he died, so did his edict, and all the Jews were able to return to Rome. Now the church in Rome had incredible growth, both while the Jews were there and after they had left. So the Gentile Christians, they stepped in to assume leadership of the church while the Jewish Christians had been deported. They did quite well. They did. They saw no reason to hand over the reins back to the Jewish Christians when they returned. So Paul's letter to the Romans was occasioned by the tension between the Jewish Christians and the Gentile Christians, right? So many of you remember this as we looked at this context in detail at our first message in this series. Keep in mind, with a lot of these mini-series, each message builds on the previous one. So if you've missed something, you may want to go back and look at it. Now, as mentioned in our first and second messages in this series, Paul is trying to solve the tension within the church at Rome by pointing out that we are all in the same boat. Sin is the same for all people, Jew and non-Jewish person alike. Therefore, the solution to sin is the same for all people. We are saved, we are justified, made right before God by what? Faith, exactly. And Paul in his letter shows how sin is universal and how the solution to that sin, our salvation, is also universal. It's by faith alone, not by following the law, either the Jewish law or the natural law, as he calls it, as non-Jewish people have. Those aren't the ways to be saved. It's only by faith. Now, a problem arises in that the Jewish Christians are struggling with how their culture, how their law, their very lifestyle, how they've been brought up and taught to please God remains relevant. Hmm. Was all that for nothing? For only saved by faith now, is all that for nothing? If we're justified before God and by God, by faith alone, what was the point of the law? See, many had a hard time with this new teaching. Who could blame them? Really, who could blame them? They grew up as a child being told that their scriptures were from God, their Ten Commandments were from God, they had a special covenant with God. Their entire culture revolved around it. And it was what they used to measure their standing before God. You see, the better we follow this, the greater our approval from God. So they thought. Now, you just want us to abandon this? Many of the Jewish Christians were struggling with this issue. It's found not only in the letter to the Romans, but it is an issue found in virtually every letter of the New Testament. How were they to understand justification, salvation by faith alone, in light of what they've dedicated their lives to and built their entire culture on? Much of Paul's letter to the Romans deals with this. And it also deals 
with the contempt that many non-Jewish Christians were showing towards the Jewish laws and customs. Increasingly, they saw less and less value in it. And Paul reminds them of its value and teaches them to respect it. Now, in our verses today, Paul deals with the universality of God's plan of making us right with him and shows how the law prepared and revealed this plan, validating the culture of the Jewish believers. So Paul validates the Jewish scriptures, the Jewish culture, while at the same time declaring that people, both Jew and non-Jew, are saved by faith alone. It's brilliant. It's really brilliant. So reading from Romans chapter 3, verses 27 to 31. Paul says, Where then is boasting? It is excluded. Because of what law? The law that requires works? No, because of the law that requires faith. For we maintain that a person is justified by faith, apart from the works of the law. Or is God the God of the Jews only? Is he not the God of the Gentiles too? Yes, of Gentiles too. Since there is only one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through that same faith. Do we then nullify the law by this faith? Not at all. Rather, we uphold the law. Hmm. Reflective of the message title of this sermon titles series, we are all in the same boat. Verse 27 starts us off with the sobering thought, where then is boasting? Huh? We're all in the same boat. Where then is boasting? It's excluded. Because of what law? The law that requires works? No, the law that requires faith. This is a very sobering thought for us today. Dare I say? Because we all think we're better than we are. This is a very sobering thought, isn't it? Where's boasting, Paul says? You can't. You can't boast. It's a sobering thought for us today. For we all think we are better than we are. Hmm. We looked at this a little bit last week. Truth is, all of us rate ourselves on how good or bad a person we are based on a comparison with those around us, don't we? We all do it. How do I compare to others in my church, my society, my school, my job, those we read about on the news and in the internet? It's a default setting in us to compare ourselves to each other. Now, add a religion to it. And this compounds our inner pride, comparing ourselves to others. We want to feel good about ourselves, to feel better about our failures. Well, yes, I'm not so good in that area, but I'm really good in this area, so it kind of cancels out. Anybody here ever think like that? No. <laughs> not at all. <laughs> Yes, we do see the sarcasm in that. <laughs> but it's true, isn't it? And then we rate how bad some things are over others. And we think, well, at least I'm not as bad as that. I, I may make some mistakes, but I would never do that. And the Jewish people were known for their morality. They were respected for it. They were fiercely devoted to fulfilling their duties, the study of the scriptures, attending synagogue, follow the food laws, don't enter a non-Jewish home, etc. Obey those Ten Commandments. I mean, who doesn't like the Ten Commandments, right? Hmm. Even the Gentiles knew and respected the Ten Commandments. Even today, many people who aren't Christians or have any religion... Respect the Ten Commandments. Fanatically earnest people, they were genuinely trying to please God. Yet it led to a sincere pride. It's clearly seen in the prayer of the Pharisee, Luke 18.11, right? Luke 18.11, where, where he prays, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people. <laughs> That's a good prayer for you. 
robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. Wow, because they're really bad, aren't they? I fast twice a week, and then they give a tenth of all I get. Hey, do you want to know something? That was a very sincere prayer. He was thankful that he wasn't like that. And in reality, it reflects much of how we think today, doesn't it? Aren't you thankful you aren't like that person? I'm very thankful you're not like that person. <laughs> hmm. Relative to those kinds of people, I'm quite good, we tend to think. There was a sense of superiority among the Jews for their religion. And there was this saying amongst them. It goes, the people who do not know the law are cursed. That's a common saying among the Jews. This is reflected in the insult that was hurled by the religious leaders towards the people who followed Jesus. It's found in John chapter 7. John chapter 7 says this. It says, The temple guards went back to the chief priests and the Pharisees who asked them, Why didn't you bring Jesus in? Well, no one ever spoke the way this man does, the guards replied. Oh, you mean he's deceived you also, the Pharisees retorted. Have any of the rulers or of the Pharisees believed in him? No, but this mob knows nothing of the law. There is a curse on them. There it is, that saying. This mob knows nothing of the law. There's a curse on them. Now Nicodemus, who had gone to Jesus earlier, and who was one of their own number, asked, Does our law condemn a man without first hearing him to find out what he has been doing? And they replied, Are you from Galilee too? Look into it, and you will find that a prophet does not come out of Galilee. Wow. A little bit of prejudice happening there, isn't there? <laughs> you know what? I love that little dig that John gets in there with the Pharisees' comment. Have any of the rulers of the Pharisees believed in him? And then immediately after that, John points out Nicodemus, a Pharisee, one of their own, <laughs> who's a believer in Jesus. Isn't that awesome? I love that. Ha ha. <laughs> and the point is how the religious leaders saw themselves as superior because they had God's law. Hmm. And not only that they had the law, but they followed it meticulously. You know, they ridiculed Jesus and his disciples for not following it. Jesus, you and your disciples don't wash your hands before a meal. Jesus, you and your disciples are picking grain on the Sabbath. Jesus, you are eating and drinking with obvious sinners and therefore are guilty by association. Jesus, you and your group don't fast. Jesus, you heal on the Sabbath, etc., etc., and so on. Hmm. Do we do similar things to each other? Do we? Do we? I hope not, but I think we do. Gerald Craig in the Interpreter's Commentary says this. He offers a sobering thought for us. Within most of us, the Pharisee is lurking very near the surface. We feel a natural gratification in our own virtue imperceptibly we begin to trust in what we are or do is he right or what yeah imperceptibly we begin to trust in what we are or do saying we do it so naturally so easily imperceptibly that sense of gratification we get from our own good deeds is an excellent indicator that we are no longer living by faith, but have gone back to living by law. For us, it would be some kind of moral standard set out by our Christian community or culture, right? We don't follow a lot of the Jewish laws, right? But for us, it would be some kind of moral standard set out by our Christian community and culture, that sense of gratification we get from our own good deeds. And if we truly understood how we are made right before God, we would not feel good about our moral achievements. Our lives would be overwhelmed with humility and thankfulness. 
God makes us right. The righteousness of God, God's saving action, we didn't do it. We simply receive what God accomplished for us by faith. Remember we talked about that in the first and second messages. So faith, trust in God's love and mercy to forgive us. God's grace to make us right. Return us to the people God intended us to be. Fulfilled in Him, making us free to love without conditions. It's not something we accomplish. It's something that God accomplishes in us. We can't boast. We didn't earn it. We can't earn it. It's freely given. It's received by faith. Hmm. You know what? We can't even boast of our faith. John Knox points out in this section on Romans. He says this, to boast of faith is to show that one does not have it. To boast of faith is to show that one does not have it. Remember last week we looked at even our faith is something God produces in us. God proves himself faithful. He awakens and births faith in us. To boast of faith even is to show that one does not have it. The recognition of our inadequacy is met with a Savior, Jesus Christ. And it takes that burden from us. The despair is replaced with joy along with the recognition of what was done with us. It's not what we've accomplished. We cannot boast. We are left to stand in awe of what Jesus has done. As Paul continues to reinforce this idea in verse 28 to 29, he goes on and he says in 28 to 29, For we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Or is God the God of the Jews only? Is he not the God of the Gentiles too? Yes, of the Gentiles too. Since there is only one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through that same faith. Hmm. All of us, we are all justified by faith, made right, restored to the person God intended us to be. This is a work that God does in us. Restored to a right standing before God, completely apart from the works of the law. Think about this. We are not made right in God's eyes by being morally good people. So why do we put so much pressure on other people to morally conform to something that we think they should be doing? Why do we do that? We are not made right in God's eyes by being morally good people. If the solution to sin is faith, why do we demand people still follow some kind of law or some kind of moral code? It's not our job. Our job is to encourage faith, to lead people to trust in Christ, which changes them. And the fruit is love for one another. How many of you have been involved in communities where we're just so caught up on a moral standard? We've got to hold people to the standard. We're going to point the fingers at those who don't. What are we doing? Hmm. <laughs> If the solution to sin is faith, why do we demand people still follow some kind of law or moral code? Especially when we ourselves continue to break it. Remember, what's the title of this message series? We're all in the same boat. And the solution to sin is not conformity to our moral standard. It's faith. On a human level, morals are important. I'm not saying they aren't important. Do not misunderstand me. You know, we aren't to steal or cheat or be greedy. For these things break down society and they cause chaos. And everyone knows this. This is more of the natural law Paul refers to. We need morals and standards and laws for society to function. But we then make the mistake of extrapolating this onto God. Things that we think God will be upset about. So we punish and we shun others, don't we? Oh, God doesn't like that. We're going to punish and shun others. You know what? That's not our business. Outside of a properly functioning society, that's not our business. Let God take care of that. 
It's God's business, not ours. The answer to sin is not conformity to a standard. It's faith. You know what? That prostitute who washed Jesus' feet, the Samaritan woman at the well who had five husbands, Zacchaeus, the tax collector who was a traitor to Israel, the Roman centurion who asked Jesus to heal his servant, would have killed many in his line of duty. And Jesus didn't call them to a moral standard, did he? He didn't. Jesus rather recognized their faith because only faith saves, not conformity to a moral standard. What do we do when we encounter others who do not conform to our moral standard or even a moral standard in the Bible? What do we do when we encounter those people? Hmm? Do we keep a distance from them? Do we distance ourselves from them? Just like the Pharisees did. They distanced themselves from them. They re remember, we read it already. They ridiculed Jesus for not distancing himself from them, but embracing them, eating and drinking with them. Hmm. What do we do? Do we distance ourselves from them? Do we prohibit them from participating in our communities? Can you think of anybody, people, that we bar or stop from participating in our communities? Jesus said to the woman, come on. The Pharisees said, look what you're letting her do. Touch your feet, participate. No, it's all good. It's a big lesson. Do we want to be like Jesus or not? How dare we keep people at a distance? You see, the solution for them is the same solution for us. The antidote to sin is faith. We're all in the same boat. Hmm. Then Paul broadens this idea. He says, God's not only the God of the Jews, but the God of the Gentiles as well. There's only one God. Therefore, the solution must be universal. Remember he asked, is God the God of the Jews only? Is he not the God of everybody? Yes. If God is God of all, Paul says, the grounds for justification, our restoration must be universal. Therefore, both Jew and non-Jew have been and always have been justified by faith. Our righteousness is by faith alone. So this brings up the confusion. Again, that struggle that the Jews were having with their culture. If God is the God of all, and humanity's salvation and faith in Jesus Christ apart from the Jewish law, has all this been for nothing? You can see why they would think that. So many had accused Paul of throwing out the law altogether. You see, this wasn't just a setting aside of some arbitrary moral standards and outdated practices. This was their entire culture, their national identity, the bond of their community and their family. So Paul needs to avoid such a thing. Paul needs to reaffirm. He needs to validate the Jewish culture. And so he does in verse 31 when he says this, Romans 3:31. Do we then nullify the law by this faith? Not at all. Rather, we uphold the law. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Sound familiar to anybody? Sure. It was the same accusation the religious leaders levied at Jesus. Have you come to abolish the law, Jesus? Matthew chapter 5, he responds to this. Matthew chapter 5, Jesus says, Do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly, I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. 
Whoa. Those are pretty strong words. Those are very strong words in defense of the law and the prophets. And Paul does the same thing. Paul uses a very strong phrase as well when he answers that question. Do we then nullify the law by this faith? Not at all. Meganoito, he says. There it is. Meganoito. It's a huge, it's a big expression that Paul frequently uses. It is an emphatically negative answer to the question or suggestion that precedes it. It expresses the intolerance of any other answer. Meganoito. Hmm. So if somebody says to you, eat your Brussels sprouts. Meganoito. I'm not eating them. <laughs> you see, Jesus is just as emphatic, right? Both Jesus and Paul recognize that following the law and the prophets is not enough. And so many jumped to the conclusion that this meant the law was being abolished and that it was pointless. But to declare it insufficient is not to pronounce it worthless. They had jumped to a conclusion. To declare it insufficient is not to pronounce it worthless. The law shows us what a life without faith looks like. We tend to break those laws. Hmm? We mean, it means that our heart, our thoughts, our desires, we want to do what's contrary to those laws. Right? The Ten Commandments tells us not to covet. But in our mind, our desires, we covet, don't we? Yes, <clears throat> I want a pair of those shoes that Pastor Chad wears every Sunday. I know that's what you're thinking. I know. <laughs> you see, in our mind we covet. In our heart we covet. The law says, have no other gods before me. Yet we don't believe God is alo is, is, alone is enough to fulfill us. Right? We put other gods before God. Oh, God, you're great, but I really want this. Hmm. The law tells us to give a percentage of our money to others in need. But we resist. We want to hold on to everything we get. The law shows us how we fail at loving one another. Jesus shows us what a life of faith looks like. That's how he fulfilled the law. Jesus transcended the law to meet the needs of others. It was his love that fulfilled the law. You see, the law still serves its purpose. It shows us what a life without faith looks like. It exposes our greed. It exposes our selfishness. It also teaches us the solution to that is not conformity, but faith. As Jesus pointed out, unless our righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees, we will not see the kingdom of God. And that is impossible without faith. We cannot exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees without faith. That's what Jesus is saying. You can't do it without faith. You see, the Pharisees were radical. They were completely fanatical about following the law and being moral people. So how can that be exceeded? By love. Do you remember from last week? How is the law fulfilled? This is the point. Paul is driving to in this letter of the Romans, Romans 13, 8. Paul sums it up. He says this, Love one another, for whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. Isn't that beautiful? Love one another, for whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. <laughs> we don't fulfill the law by following it. We fulfill it by loving one another. Isn't that good news? It's really good news. Love for one another is the fruit, is the evidence of real faith. Galatians 5, 6 says this, the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. It's one of my favorite verses. The only thing that counts is 
It's faith expressing itself through love. The solution to sin, our spiritual condition, the solution to all of the outward expressions of sin, greed, selfishness, manipulation, cheating, dishonesty. It's not conformity, but it's faith. This changes us into the people we're called to be, people of love. And last week we looked at this. We looked at God's glory in us restored. We become the loving people we're called to be. The law continues to serve its purpose. Shows us what a life without faith looks like. We break those laws. Jesus shows us what a life of perfect faith looks like and therefore fulfills the law. And so we're invited into this love. Not by conforming to its behavior, but by faith in Jesus Christ, which expresses itself through love. Therefore, whether Jew or Gentile, they can embrace the law and its purpose. Both recognize their salvations by faith only and experience its expression as love. Wow, Paul, well done. See how he brought them together? So no matter who they are or who we are, we are all in the same boat, saved by faith only, called not to demand others to conform to a moral standard, but called to love. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you looked at humanity. You saw how far we'd fallen. And you inspired people to walk lives of faith. And then you created a whole culture to lead us to that faith. And then you made provision for our salvation on the cross. Or what a beautiful expression of your love. Give us courage to have faith so that your love would flow through us to one another. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.